Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast evaluating the effectiveness of training, animal care, and use personnel. I'm Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Lockheed. The Laboratory Animal Welfare Training Exchange is an organization of people who train in and for the laboratory animal science field by sharing ideas on methods and materials for training. Our members can learn together how best to meet the training and qualification requirements of national regulations and guidelines. Since 1994, conferences have been held every two years for trainers to exchange information on their training programs in the U.S. and abroad. For more information, please visit lati.org. We have a few important announcements before we begin. We encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can via email offline. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would like to take this opportunity now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Melissa Dyson. Dr. Melissa Dyson received her veterinary degree from the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine and completed a residency in corporate medicine at the University of Missouri in conjunction with the Research Animal Diagnostic Laboratories. Her clinical research interests include laboratory animal medicine management and infectious disease. She is the director of the UM Training Corps and provides educational programs for animal care and news personnel. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for her presentation. For attending today, um, as our moderator said, I'll be talking about evaluating the effectiveness for training for animal care and use personnel. So, you know, the initial question is, of course, why do we train? And I think most of us in the field have a lot of different reasons that we're interacting with animal care and use personnel and providing educational programs. Um, some of the reasons that are important to, I think, most of us are often training is required by our regulations and guidelines. Um, we want to promote humane and judicious use of animals by making sure that the folks that work with them are appropriately prepared and competent. Um, we want to use training to communicate information on the institution's practices, policies, and structure. And we want to, um, at the most basic level, obviously provide employees the necessary job skills. So just to review, we'll talk a little bit in more detail about um, the comments that each of these, these um, regulations or guides have on training. Um, we have commentary or guidance from the U.S. government principles for the utilization and care of vertebrate animals used in testing, research, and training. Um, details are provided to us in the Animal Welfare Act regulations um, and in the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. In the government principles, um, it's indicated that investigators and other personnel should be appropriately qualified and experienced for conducting procedures on animals, and that arrangements need to be made to have training available, including um, training on the proper and humane care and use of animals used in research programs. Um, the Animal um, Welfare Act regulations also ask that training be available to make sure that individuals have access to information on appropriate practices. And they provide additional detail, including information on what types of um, information need to be provided. Um, information on humane methods of animal maintenance and experimentation. Information on the concept availability and use of research or testing methods that limit the use of animals um, or minimize pain and distress, the appropriate use of anesthetics, analgesics, and tranquilizers for animals used in the facility, um, methods for reporting deficiencies or concerns for animals used uh, in the program, the utilization of services um, available to provide information on methods and alternatives to animals, and to animals use. And as we jump into the guide, we see um, fairly similar information provided. Um, training needs to be available for, for individuals on animal care and use legis legislation, regulations and guidance, um, the IACOC functions and responsibilities, ethics of animal use and concepts of the three R's, 
methods for reporting concerns about animal use, occupational health and safety issues, and even specific details on animal handling, appropriate aseptical surgical technique, anesthesia, analgesia, and euthanasia. So the big question is, you know, at that level, is training mandatory? Um, so we know from all our guidance that personnel must be qualified um, and trained to perform tasks associated with animals. Um, and that training should be available and must be documented. So ultimately, you know, we are, our guidance is telling us that we need to make sure that people know what they're doing. Training is often that tool, but assessing their competency is a big part of that as well. And I think we see some of the um, standards of how that can be practiced in how um, the ALEC program description asks questions to us about describing the animal care needs program at our sites. So in the ALEC program description, under the training, education, and continuing educational opportunities section, ALEC asks us to describe how the IACUC provides oversight and evaluates the effectiveness of training programs and the assessment of personnel competencies. So training and the assessment of competencies are clearly joined um, as, as joint efforts in affecting appropriate practices for using animals. And evaluating the effectiveness, effectiveness of those programs is imperative to make sure that the ultimate goal of appropriate animal care and use is performed appropriately. In further sections, questions are asked of the veterinarian animal care staff as well as the research staff to describe training and continuing educational opportunities. Um, additionally, the research team, um, for the research team, timing of the training, mechanisms to ensure that, train, that the research team has appropriate knowledge and expertise and appropriate practices are also listed and discussed. So as we can see from our regulations and standards of practice, our ultimate goal is ensuring that personnel are qualified and trained to perform their tasks associated with animals. We can really view that as being comprised of several factors. One is appropriate and effective training, and the IACUC is clearly tasked with evaluating the training, the effectiveness of that training. Um, a, an important partner to that is competency assessment. So when providing training, making sure that the training is effective in promoting competency or that staff that come with experience are appropriately trained and competent um, are important factors. And then, of course, the, the partner of the IACUC and post-approval monitoring practices to ensure that appropriate methods are actually in place and utilized in the animal facility, in laboratories, in the real, real work life settings um, are an essential piece of ensuring that training is effective and that it's being put into practice where appropriate. One of the things that we'll be talking about today as we go through some of the different ways to evaluate training um, is the IACUC Handbook Survey. So the IACUC Handbook um, is a methodology that's used surveys of approximately 300 institutions using animals in research across the United States. So those can vary from small to large formats, from academia to industry or pharmaceutical companies. But in each chapter, and there are many chapters that don't deal with training, in each chapter a number of questions are posed to um, respondents to get a feel for how people are achieving appropriate training or evaluating the effectiveness of training across the field. Um, I had the privilege of being able to write and edit that chapter in the most recent version, so I'll be using a lot of the results of that to talk about practices that are in play across the community as we go through this presentation. So how is the effectiveness of training being evaluated out in the field? Um, it's a little bit variable, and most of this data is from 2012-2013 when the manual was published, but that's not that long ago, and it's really interesting to see what people are struggling with as we go through some of these surveys. Um, important to note here that at the time that these questions were posed, about 48% of those respondents were not using any metrics to evaluate training. Um, there were other methodologies used, so one institution could have answered yes to multiple of these sections. So 29% of respondents were using data or reports from post-approval monitoring assessments, um, and 35% of those were actually using data and reports from worksite assessments by individuals like trainers, IACUC, or animal care and veterinary staff. So reports were utilized, assessments of programs, but there weren't a whole lot of uh, metrics and data being gathered um, and utilized at that time to evaluate the effectiveness of training programs. I think it's a challenge that we all face. Evaluation of training is a really 
is time consuming and difficult to get really good information on whether or not training programs are proving effective um, at ensuring that we have appropriate and competent animal care and use. So the three subject areas that I'm going to touch on today are evaluating instructional design, evaluating learners, um, and evaluating instructors. So evaluating learners or um, evaluation of training by and, of, and evaluating of learners um, is probably one of the most familiar areas um, that most of us have experienced. So evaluating how a person's learned in class, evaluating how they're applying that information. But I think the other parts of that program include how training is designed and developed and implemented and given to those learners and how we ensure that our instructors are actually able to appropriately deliver information and assess those learners. Most of us probably came into training in the laboratory animal field um, by being subject matter experts. We're veterinarians, we're trainers, we're animal care staff who are good at what we do and end up moving into teaching others. Most of us don't have educational backgrounds and so developing skills as trainer and designing educational programs and evaluating educational programs is a big area of growth for us. And I think evaluating how we do that on a regular basis helps improve the training programs that are then delivered to the learners. So I'm going to start with instructional design. This is one of many, many examples of instructional design um, systems and programs that you can find. I like this system because it's simple and direct, and most of us aren't really ready to jump into complex texts on how to design um, instructional materials coming from a subject matter expert background. But I think this gives some guidance to those of us working in this field on really breaking down and thinking of developing training materials in a logical manner, from an analyzing the needs for training, developing and designing that training, to implementing and evaluating training. Another way to look at this design model is thinking of evaluation as a key point or cornerstone in this whole process. So whether you're doing the analysis for the needs of training, designing, developing, or even implementing or delivering training, incorporating evaluation at each of these levels is really important and valuable so that you're preventing mistakes along the way, and as, as those continue and you're running training classes on a regular basis, continuing to evaluate the effectiveness of that training or the delivery of that training um, can be pretty important. Okay, so let's jump into analysis really quickly. You know, you really have to start with goals here. What is our ultimate goal for all of our training programs? Ensuring personnel are qualified and trained to perform tasks associated with animals, as we talked about earlier. So effective training is going to be key. Competency assessment as a partner to assessing the appropriate delivery of materials um, and post-approval monitoring, as we discussed earlier, are all important factors. So one of the things I'd like to point out at this point is that Obviously, training is very important to me and all of us, and it's an extremely important component of an animal care program or of any work site educational program. But it's not a solution to all problems. I think even before an analysis of what we need to train on is performed, analyzing whether training is the answer is extremely important. Um, performance issues tend to be multifactorial. So if we have a group of individuals that not performing the function correctly, say you have individuals who are um, not putting dirty caging in the appropriate place. Uh, assuming that that is a training issue, um, before analyzing what's going wrong in that scenario, maybe we don't have appropriate racks available for placement of dirty cages. Um, maybe, um, maybe doors are locked to certain facility areas at time in which investigative personnel need to be using them. Um, so personnel management and program management issues are all as important as training when you're analyzing a problem. Um, a training needs analysis is an important key and even a performance analysis to make sure that our performance problem is really related to lack of knowledge and not other performance-based issues. So moving back to instructional design um, and our adding model, some of the main pieces in the design and the development phase involve making sure that you know and the person or the person who's developing your training knows what they should be training on, who um, they're teaching, and who should be giving the training, um, how to deliver training, and when to deliver training. And all of these factors we often just assume when we're putting together training materials. Um, however, really analyzing and evaluating if you're answering, 
answering these questions correctly and going back and reevaluating these questions when you reevaluate your, uh, evaluate your training program can really highlight some areas of weakness that maybe need to be updated um, to be most effective. So curriculum content, we've got a lot of materials and information available. Obviously, they're going to be directed by the goal and work tasks. We do have a lot of guidance, as we discussed, in the Animal Welfare Act regs and the guide. Um, we have a lot of subject matter experts around the people in cage wash know how to do cage wash. Your research staff and your veterinarians and technicians know how to do a lot of the animal procedures that are around. So consulting with them as you're developing training is very important. But there's some also publications and resources out there to help guide that that I think can be used to develop training, but also use as tools to evaluate training that's in play to make sure that we're continuing to meet both the regulatory and standard of practice requirements for your training program. So most of us are probably familiar with the guide um, that the NRC put out in 1991. It's fairly dated, but still a really good um, introductory premise to training materials for the laboratory animal community. It's entitled The Education and Training in the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Um, it is a guidebook that includes curriculum and recommendations for training on regulations, legislation, animal use, and even specific um, species use and surgery needs. Um, there have been many platforms that have grown out of this information, and once again, it's, it's really a good basis. At that time, most training was very focused on training the research team, and there wasn't a whole lot of information really thought through about training the veterinarians, the animal care staff, the IACUP, all those allied groups. And so things have really grown and developed in a lot of other directions since then. In 2007, ILAR put out an updated volume with a summary of the 91 um, guide, as well as summaries of new training and learning strategies, papers and articles on training for the IACUP, animal care staff, lots of those other program areas that really brought some of those concepts um, further along. The IACUC handbook that I mentioned earlier, I think is a great resource, not only for training, but many other aspects of oversight of animal care and use um, that the IACUC may be responsible for. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, that um, ALAS is the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science. It's one of the preeminent organizations within laboratory animal medicine and science. They actually host a learning library that has many, many online courses available, some for free. Um, that you can utilize to educate yourself or utilize for your whole educational program at each institution. And some of those modules are each actually also customizable. So that's a valuable link to go visit um, if you're looking at bringing training into your program, especially online training. Um, City, the Collaborative Interinstitutional inter Training Initiative is a similar program that provides online training resources that can be used for your institution. And then lastly, of course, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our program sponsor today, the Laboratory Animal Welfare Training Exchange, or LATTE, at latte.org. As our moderator discussed, um, LATTE is an organization that promotes animal welfare through effective training and educational um, programs for animal research professionals. So trainers from all over get together, um, share ideas, share methods. That's the big part of the exchange of our program. So membership in this organization allows you access to this exchange, access to listservs where you can interact with trainers from other areas and share ideas and learn. Uh, we also have our biennial conference that occurs every two years. Uh, this year that will be hosted um, in Hershey, Pennsylvania by the Penn State um, Hershey Medical Center. Um, we will be focusing on teaching, learning, and supporting animal welfare, and that will be June 13th to 16th um, in Hershey. It's going to be a great time. I think we're going to learn a lot. We're going to network a lot. And of course, there'll be lots of great chocolate. They've already sent us a lot to get ready for the program. So if you're interested, please do consider joining us. All right. So we talked a lot about what in so, uh, several different areas. And now I'm going to jump into the who of who we're training. And once again, to stimulate thinking about both in developing training programs and evaluating existing programs, are we giving the right information to the right individuals? So initially, when training became more and more important in the laboratory animal field, training for the research team was the focus of what we, everyone was thinking about. How do we make sure that the scientist or their staff understands how to appropriately perform procedures in research animals? But as we've gone, grown, obviously, we all realized that training for our IACUP members and our animal care staff even occupational health and safety um, information needs to be passed on to all these individuals. 
Um, so ultimately, anyone who works with or is responsible for work with animals, who works in animal support areas, with animal caging and tissues, or even in a regulatory manner, needs some level of education so that they understand institutional expectations and appropriate standards of practice. So for, we're going to jump into another one of these surveys here from the handbook. Um, because I think it's really easy to just put a list out on PowerPoint and say all these people need to be trained. But I think all of you know if you're doing this in your programs already or facing these questions or evaluating your programs, these questions aren't always so simple. There's lots of what about this, I need a special or different consideration, why should I have to take training because I have experience or because I'm only working a small amount of time. So it's, it's valuable to see um, surveys from other places and to see some of the details that some of us are struggling with to make sure that we are comprehensively applying educational programs to everyone that needs them across institutions. So these are some of the questions that you may want to ask yourself when evaluating your training program and its effectiveness and its comprehensive nature. So the question that was posed to survey respondents here is, do principal investigators who will not be performing animal work have to partake in an institutional animal care needs training program? So in this scenario, a laboratory director who is responsible for grants and responsible for all the research going on in the laboratory may not themselves actually do any hands-on work with animals. So does your program require that they take training? So 37% of respondents here said that they, yes, that they require principal investigators or laboratory directors to take the same training as staff who perform the procedures, even if they aren't doing that hands-on work. Whereas about 35% of individuals say only basic training is required, more detailed training is not required, and around 22% say that no additional training of any kind is required at all. Now, this, the results of these surveys are not intended to show you right or wrong. They're intended to make you think about the different types of areas that you need to evaluate and consider when you're looking at these questions on who needs to take training in your institution. The second question, if a person has successfully completed training at a different institution, should the IACUC at the new institution, your institution, require that she retake a similar course at your institution or otherwise demonstrate her capabilities? So for example, you have a new scientist who's worked with mice um, in research for 20 years and you want them to take the introductory to mouse training course. Is that required at your program? So 66% of respondents says it varies with circumstances, but they can waive some training requirements. 29% um, said that they never waive training requirements. Um, I know our institution has recently moved into that philosophy, and they feel that for our institution, there are a number of um, specific standards of practice or methodologies for adhering to requirements that they feel are important enough that anyone coming into the institution working with animals has to take all of the training available or have um, a competency assessment. Uh, thirdly, can someone with experience in surgery, anesthesia, and human patients perform these procedures on animals without additional training or competency assessment? So for example, a human surgeon um, who's used to doing nephrectomy or kidney removal in a human wants to perform that procedure in a rabbit. Would you require that they take additional training? 41% of respondents said no, they don't require um, no, they don't allow this person to perform procedures without additional training. So that investigator would have to take rabbit surgery or some combination of that type of training. 23% of respondents said, yes, we might make, make them take training, but we evaluate each request on a case-by-case -case basis. So it may depend on the level of invasiveness or responsibility that individual has to actual animal welfare care and use. All right, should students working with live animals during a class be required to participate in an animal use training program? So this is obviously much more focused on an academic setting, but we may have large numbers of students, 300 in some cases, taking a course during a semester that may involve some level of interaction with an animal. Maybe it's just observing rats, or maybe it even involves animal surgery that a teacher is actually overseeing. So in this scenario, 34 percent of respondents said course instructors provide training to students in the course rather than the animal program. 19 percent of respondents indicated that students in courses receive the same or similar training as that provided to research personnel. Depending on your institution, this can be a pretty hefty number of classes to be able to interact with an animal. So once again, this is not a right or wrong survey. It is valuable to see how other people are achieving 
for answering these questions for their programs when you are evaluating how comprehensive or effective your training is for your ultimate goal. All right. Does your IA cook require that short-term personnel, for example, summer students, visiting professors, etc., complete the same training requirements as full-time investigators and staff? So, for example, maybe you have a professor that's coming in for two weeks um, to do a short-term project or demonstrate a procedure to a collaborator lab at your institution. Uh, in this scenario, about 79% of respondents said short-term employees have to fill the same training requirements. And if that takes two weeks and they're only here for two weeks, they can't do work with animals until they finish them. That can be pretty extensive. 12% um, of respondents indicated that short-term employees have a somewhat modified training requirement. So maybe they're going to come for a short period of time and they get one modified module and can only work with supervised experienced staff, something like that. Okay. Uh, lastly, if a person from another institution or commercial organization is to demonstrate how to perform a procedure on a live animal, how can the IA cook assure that that person is qualified to perform the procedure? So in this scenario, maybe you have a representative of a company coming in and showing a group of physicians how to use their product in a pig surgery. Um, not 31% of respondents didn't have this experience. It's something we certainly see in academic in entities. 44% um, of respondents said that they reviewed the written qualifications of that individual, and 24% accepted written statements from the principal investigator, whereas 29% said they actually have a veterinarian watch the person perform the procedure, um, and that veterinarian may stop the procedure if it's inappropriate. Now, remember that respondents can answer in the positive to more than one of these questions, so some people may be doing both. Once again, these may be small groups of what goes on in your institution, but they're all participants in the animal care and use program, and evaluation of the decisions made at each of these levels is important. Okay, so we talked a lot about the what and who design and develop, designing and developing training programs. Let's talk a little bit about the how. So there's lots of different ways to deliver training. I think we're all pretty aware of that. Um, it's going to vary with subject matter, with the resources that you have available, with your needs. Um, it extends from doing all sort of online computer-based courses. There's lots of value in those. You can directly reach lots of people at lots of different times. You can document them easily. You can implant quizzes and evaluations with online um, training modules. In our own internal assessments for our program, we actually do post-online course assessments in workshop classes. Unfortunately, we're finding that a large number of individuals don't retain a great deal of information from computer-based courses. By the time they walk in the door as a new person or are overwhelmed with the large amount of detail they're given, by the time they get to a hands-on practice, they don't remember a lot of that information. So continuing education programs or workshop and hands-on courses following online courses may be a better way to capture and, and keep the information that you need them to have long term. Lectures and seminars are also very valuable. They're obviously more time intensive per person for the information you want to transmit. There's no way I think that we can ever replace the value of workshops or hands-on courses, especially if you're teaching an individual a physical skill that they have to learn and then demonstrate. However, those are fairly time intensive. And so utilizing partners in that beyond the trainers, veterinarians, and even the um, research personnel that may be appropriately experienced are really ways to capitalize on the diversity of experience in the community. Another big question here, I think, when you're evaluating your training program is no matter the format, are the courses addressing the needs of the learners, both in instructional design, but also in sort of theories of how adults learn in the workplace? I think many of us not being trained in educational communities don't always have a feel for what that means to the adult learner in the workplace. We'll talk a little bit about that more later in the presentation. Okay, so another part of who is who should provide training. Lots of different folks in lots of different places, from staff trainers to veterinarians to IACUC staff and even occupational health and safety personnel are teaching people things all over the place. Uh, we'll talk more about this a little bit later as well, but as, as I mentioned, most of us aren't trained as educators. And so evaluating how you ensure that those delivering information are able to do so effectively is very important. So who provides training at institutions um, across the country? Looks like we have about 74% of respondents, the animal care staff, technicians, supervisors, 
um, and veterinarians are a big part of that training program. Um, we talked about this slide a little earlier as well. I cook staff about 17%. At this stage, only about 30% of people had um, dedicated training program personnel. I think that's growing even in small institutions now because of the emphasis and importance on regular comprehensive training and documenting and evaluation of that training. Okay, finally, when. Um, another piece, important piece of that before you're implementing is deciding when training needs to happen. So this is a question posed in the handbook. Must personnel be trained before a research project begins? 50% um, of respondents here said that in most instances, the person must have basic skills needed before the project begins, but more detailed skills can be gained during the course of the project. And then 33% um, said in most instances, the person must be fully trained. And I think looking at our guidance and the questions in the ALEC program description, making sure that people are trained before they are actually applying procedures and working with animals or working in the job site is extremely important. And I think this is a this can be challenging trying to get everybody in the door trained appropriately before they're released to the system and then um, allowing us to track and do continuing education is an additional burden there. So in the survey we also ask what are the consequences of failure to complete required training by the principal investigator or members of the research team? So various things um, occur, and most often um, protocol or MIM approval is limited um, for completion of training, or personnel restricted from performing procedures, um, getting into facilities, those types of things until training is complete. We found in our own experience, without a hard stop preventing people from doing their work in an academic environment, we would generally have less than 70% compliance with training requirements. So I think most people have found at this point without hard stops for training requirements, um, it's difficult to control. Uh, so, you know, evaluating your program, if you do not have high rates of compliance or good rates of compliance with your training requirement, you know, evaluating that system and creating some hard stops within that system for, to prevent people from moving forward without completing training, um, I think most of us have found is pretty important to making sure training is done properly. Also, at what interval is periodic retraining of animal users required? So this is continuing education. And as we saw when we looked at um, some samples from questions in the ALEC program description, continuing education is being quite emphasized. So at this time, we had about 31% um, of respondents said this was not applicable, so there was no continuing education. 24% um, of respondents were doing continuing education every third year or greater, and then it varied beyond that. So I think that's important to look at. Obviously, every three years is sort of a natural cycle for us because it mimics the cycle of a protocol approval, and it's a valuable time to create a stop at which you can grab, grab folks and, and require that they complete training. But as we found in some of our own evaluations, if we have people retaining less than 50% of what they're getting from just completion of online modules, Continuing education is extremely important not only to try to continue to educate them to the process of their work cycle, but also to make sure that they are up with new standards as we know policies and institutional practices sort of are in continual process of change. So as you're evaluating a training program in this aspect, looking at continuing education and its value and effect on compliance and knowledge as a whole is pretty important. So what criteria are used by your institution to indicate to the IPUC that an individual requires more training? So beyond just standard required training, are there ways in which we really need to evaluate and look at how do we, how and when do we need to recommend that someone gets more? Um, so 65%, 75% folks are looking at non-compliance report or supervisor or PI recommendations. And then 51% are reporting poor performance on post-training evaluation processes, PAMs, competency evaluation, those types of things. Having the ability for a trainer to say, you know what, you haven't, you haven't done this appropriately, you need to go back to a training, having those processes worked out and relied upon can be a pretty important factor. If you don't have the ability for a trainer or a supervisor to say this individual is not performing appropriately and needs to go back to training, then we've got a big gap in the effectiveness of our training program and the oversight of that. Okay, so we talked about um, evaluation of instructional design. Now we're going to jump into evaluation of learners. So like I said, this is probably the most familiar area of evaluation that most of us have experienced. Um, the evaluation of training by the learners and the evaluation of the training's effect on those learners. Um, 
you can look at this in a simple manner on four different levels. Um, one to four being sort of one the easiest and four being the most complex to gather. Um, at the same time, the level one types of training, maybe um, the data we gather from those types of evaluations are the least impactful, even though they're the easiest. Um, this gives a lot, of, a lot of great information about what people are gathering from the training classes and are tools to then spread out and look at sort of do we have problems with instructional design? Do we have problems that we need to optimize with how we're delivering training, those types of things? Okay, so evaluating reaction. We gather this info by asking people immediately or post or a little further down the road post training, how did training go? Um, you need to make sure that evaluation methodologies ask what you want to know, that they're well designed, and they encourage complete and honest responses. Like I said, these are easy, quick, and they're tallyable, so we can put together metrics with this information. However, they can be pretty subjective, and it's, there's not a whole lot of knowledge gained for us, and you really don't know how many skills and information that the, the learner retains ultimately. Some tips from these types of evaluations are, you know, keep it short, focus on your objectives, only ask about things that you can change. Um, incorporating closed-ended questions, you know, how would you rate this class one to five, um, those sorts of things are very valuable. Yes and no types of answers tend to be difficult to follow up on. Too many, too many answer options are overwhelming. You also want to tell all your learners that you value their feedback and encourage them to provide it. Um, and make sure that those forms are anonymous so that they can feel comfortable providing that. I think some really big pieces of this are that not only do you need to assess the results regularly, so we have our trainers review them after every class, um, but also assess them in a group and a summary methodology. The semi-annual program review is a great time for that, for really looking at, you know, are we getting all five that everything's great, or are we seeing in certain classes that um, certain evaluations aren't are coming through well and why are we having those problems and what are our plans to fix them. We also reevaluate the form and methodology itself regularly. So if you have sort of this um, evaluation methodology going and you look back over six months and say, you know what, every time we give this class we get fives on everything and we get no valuable information from this method, you may want to change your method of evaluation to try to get better information. Okay, so level two, we're going to tap into evaluating learning. Um, this on one hand seems very simple, but we know it can be very complex to, to really assess how much people retain in the long term. So we can use tests before and after evaluation is, is even more valuable. So evaluating what people know beforehand compared to what they gain after the training program. Simulations and demonstrations can also be really valuable tools. So if you're learning, um, a methodology, learning a new practice, you're doing IP injections in mice, having the person be able to demonstrate that appropriately can be a great evaluation of their competency in the practice. One of the things that, that we have learned with evaluations, we use evaluations not only to evaluate our learners, but also to evaluate our course delivery um, and content, is that if we tell individuals they don't have to put their name on the evaluation, that we're actually using this tool to test our own training, they're much more comfortable answering questions. So we actually use a lot of pre and post testing in those methodologies to get a general census of the learning that goes on and the effectiveness of tools rather than grading individuals. Um, so like the other was, it's a great way to demonstrate what they've learned in the immediate scenario. On the other hand, it doesn't really guarantee application at the work site. It, it's certainly a step in the right direction, though. And this information can be very palliable. It, can't lend, it can lend itself into um, metrics and data that you can easily pre prevent, present to your IACUC or your animal program oversight body so that they can feel that um, training programs are being evaluated and assess them with those tools. Once again, as we mentioned in the evaluating um, sort of the learner's response, assessing your results regularly and assessing the methods that you're using to get those results regularly is really important to keep a continual process of self-evaluation and improvement going. So evaluating behavior, this is level three. We're stepping up into the next level. We get a lot of good information from this methodology, but it's time and resource intensive. So you've got to allow time for behavior change. So someone is going to apply what you taught them differently a week after training versus six weeks to a year. 
um, going to the work site to see actually how people are performing the fun functions you've trained them on. That can be done by trainers, post-approval monitoring staff, even supervisors. What's important here is that everyone has the same concept of what the expectations are so that the data that you get back um, is consistent and valuable. So you can even create assessment sheets for evaluating behavior that all of those different teams have available. So when they turn um, workplace assessments back in, you have detailed information that you can follow on what pieces were lacking in workplace application related to training. As I mentioned, this is on one hand the truest assessment as activities and the results of learning from your training. It's time and staff intensive, but I do think um, if you put work into consistent expectations and even form, formats for feedback, you can actually get better information here. And it can also feel intrusive to staff and interrupt work processes. So if someone knows you're evaluating them, they may change or follow procedures in a more detailed way than they would otherwise. The last level there is evaluating behavior, or sorry, is evaluating results. So evaluating how the training program has had an effect on the compliance and welfare and practices in your program as a whole. And this is really valuable. It takes a lot of time and design to capture. So one of the mistakes that we have certainly made in our own program is trying to capture this information too late in the game. So if you really want to evaluate results or return on investment of a training program, you have to design your data capture methodologies to capture baseline data before a change occurs. So if you want to see if you can improve compliance with aseptic surgical practices in your facility. You really want a good feel for how aseptic surgical practices are now. And you want metrics and measurable data, so a check sheet on how many times people aren't using appropriate disinfectants or aren't, or aren't following sterile technique or breaking sterile technique in surgery. If you can actually break those things down, get an analysis of what's going on, that lends to the development of your training program, and then you can use those same questions to evaluate change in that program. Um, it takes a lot of foresight um, to plan those sorts of evaluations in the long term, but those are really um, great assessment tools to capture how well training has changed a program or culture that was challenging in the first place. So, you know, you want to make sure that you have your goal well designed and that the, the metrics you want to capture from the beginning to the end of the project. Um, and also know that the change over time can be affected by many factors, so it may not just be training. You, just the fact that you're evaluating people may change their behavior, and the fact that they're getting evaluated may in itself be a reminder and culture change tool um, in addition to just the training program. Okay, so when looking at this, Sorry, make sure I have the right slide. In looking at this, we have we do have some survey results from the handbook. So as part of the training program for your animal care and use um, program, is any form of evaluation, assessment, or testing utilized? So it varies. We have 58% of respondents um, saying that a demonstration of competency is required during training sessions. 44% says that works out evaluation of competency by supervisory personnel is employed. 38% um, are doing written exams, so those may be the same organizations as well. And 16% are doing no testing. So obviously it's quite diverse, and I think as we look more and more at evaluation of training, using all of those different levels of tools, whether they're post-training evaluations, examinations during um, or after a class, competency demonstrations and work site evaluations, they're all very important pieces of evaluating training. The best way to look at the effectiveness in training is design captures, capture methodologies for data in a way that you can really look at a summary and retrospective of what's been happening to get a feel for how effective the program is in implementation. Okay, lastly I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluating instructors. <clears throat> So we talked a little bit about this earlier. Who do we have providing training? We have a pretty diverse group. And we looked at this survey, uh, these survey results fairly recently, earlier in the presentation. Veterinarians, animal care staff, supervisors, managers, IACUC staff, research personnel, and even in some um, areas designated training personnel are teaching people all sorts of um, various pieces of information. Most of those folks aren't educators. 
And so making sure that we have the right tools to train those trainers, and then in kind, using those tools to evaluate the effectiveness of those trainers are important tools to improving your program and evaluating your trainers and giving them <clears throat> goals for improving their own work status and proficiency. So we'll talk a little bit about transitioning from a subject matter expert to a trainer, adult learning theories, um, instructional design education for trainers, and then making sure trainers know how to evaluate their own training. So subject matter expertise is something most of us have, whether you're really great at surgery or you know how to change mouth cages or you work in the IACUC office and that's a really important part of what you do. Um, what we find though is that specialists and expert don't always transfer their information to others very easily. Um, so you may select the person in your staff that's best at doing IP injections in mice and they may, may not be very effective at training others in doing that. One of the organizations that I've found very helpful in starting out a new trainer with some great tools um, to learn how to teach is an organization that used to be called the American Society of Training and Development, ASTD, but it's now called the Association for Talent Development, or TD. Um, I call it ASTD because many of the references that I provide are actually in their old format. So they provide educational programs, conferences, and have a number of publications that I've found very valuable. They're focused on workplace education and development, not just laboratory animal science, but some of their train-the-trainer programs have really been excellent tools for us. So instructional development for trainers. Learning centered course design is really essential. Um, really focusing developing training materials on what the learner needs to know and how the learner needs to know is really important. And I think most of us as, sub as subject matter experts really think more about how we understand something than how the learner needs to understand it. For example, experts often provide interesting yet non-essential information that overloads the learner. So does a lab member really need to know when all the amendments to the Animal Welfare Act regulations occurred and what they contained? I seriously doubt that information is valuable to their appropriate care and use of animals in the research setting. It's overwhelming to them and it takes up space in your training program that's not valuable, even though it may be really fascinating to you if you're working with regulations all the time. How does a student learn? So experts tend to group information in larger chunks and novices. If I'm explaining to you how to give an IP injection in a mouse, um, I may tell you in three steps, restrain the mouse, get your needle, put the mouse's head down, and inject appropriately. There could be 15 to 20 different steps within that system that a novice does not understand. And until you understand how to break those down in appropriately organized and consistent manner, your trainee or learner is going to be quite lost and if you may be an expert in an area, you may not be transmitting that to them appropriately. Adult learning, also the theory and this, this pedagogy and idea that adults learn differently than children can be very important as well, especially for those of us who don't have educational backgrounds. So obviously learning is the process of personalizing new information. Training, on the other hand, is the process of helping students make those connections and personalizing that information. There are some theories that say adults have different ways of learning than children, and it's important for educators to know this when they're designing and delivering training in the professional setting. So some of the principles that we talk about are adults really want to know why they're learning something, and addressing that as part of training both to the individual and their supervisor can be extremely valuable in the attitude that they bring to training and what they're willing to take out of it. Adults also have a repository of lifetime experiences, so they're not novices in life, and they may come with both good and bad experiences in <clears throat> whatever procedure that you're trying to teach them about. Acknowledging that can be very helpful in developing a relationship with them and opening them up to learning from you, and you also may learn about information that they have that's novel to you or about why they're having some challenges in areas that you're trying to get them to move toward. Adults also really like to use hands-on problem solving for learning, so memorization of facts and figures is not going to help, nor is it really effective to work site application. Um, so applying this knowledge and skills, giving them quizzes, giving them a chance to discuss um, training, giving them a chance to demonstrate and apply those skills is very important. If you look back at your training program when you're evaluating it and you're not incorporating some of these ideas into how you develop and implement and provide training programs, that there's a concern and you may need to reevaluate some of them. Okay, so some of the things to think about is giving them a chance to discuss 
prior experiences and converse and ask questions about new information, giving them a chance to self-assess, I get it, I don't get it, and ask for help if they need it, reflecting on those prior experiences and practicing new skills whenever necessary. Um, lastly, talk to the trainers and make sure that they understand how to self-evaluate. So a lot of what we have talked about throughout this presentation has been um, knowing how to develop training, knowing how to develop learners, creating forms or programs to gather data on evaluation. But if your trainer or you as a trainer don't really understand how to utilize those tools or even to evaluate the success of a class that you've developed, some of that can be lost. So even some of the simple features of did the course run smoothly? Were the timelines appropriate? Did students respond appropriately? Were folks sleeping in class? Were they asking questions? Um, we actually address some of these with our large team of trainers. We have so many people providing the same types of courses at different times. We have pretty strict templates on the content that has to be provided, say, in a class about the use of hazards or in a class about the handling of a rat. Um, and buried within each of those are actually questions that they have to pose to the learners at certain times to make sure the learners are paying attention, to emphasize certain points, and give those adult learners a chance to really think and self-reflect on what they've learned so far in the course. We find those to be really valuable tools. It's another thing to think about in educating your trainers on how to self-evaluate. Um, did students gain expected skills and knowledge? So if, you're, if your trainer is not experienced and they have not developed in their training program methodology, methodologies to evaluate learning and learners as part of their process, that's something that needs to be implemented. Um, and then establishing competency and proficiency standards. Clearly this is one of the most direct ways evaluating the competency of an individual after a learning experience is one of the clearest and best ways to evaluate the effectiveness of that training. What we found that if we let a trainer go and tell them evaluate competency before you graduate someone from this class, if they don't understand how to develop a competency standard, they're not effective at that methodology. Because if you read the literature or ask training professionals how they evaluate competency, it, the answers run the gamut of many possibilities. A lot of people use the idea that if a person can demonstrate appropriate and a procedure appropriately one to three times, they're given a competency pass. Um, but if your trainer doesn't have the experience in that, the education on how and what are the factors that should be evaluated for competency, um, helping them develop those tools, thinking through when I'm restraining a mouse or picking an animal up from a cage, what are the 10 different things I need to think about that happen appropriately. The fact that the animal is comfortable, that the animal's health is evaluated, that we're remembering to wear gloves, all those sorts of things are the many layers of detail that need to be thought through with developing competency standards that you need to evaluate and make sure that your trainers understand how to apply. Okay, so we've um, talked about lots of stuff. We've talked about transitioning trainers from subject matter experts to educators, adult learning theories, making sure they understand instructional design and evaluating evaluation methodologies. So in conclusion, we talked about a lot of stuff today in a lot of different areas. There are many levels of evaluation beyond just the traditional methodologies of tests um, and worksite assessment, although those are very important tools and I think can really lend themselves to metrics and methodologies of looking at the effectiveness of your program. Ultimately, our goal is to ensure that personnel are qualified and trained to perform tasks associated with animals. Um, I think, you know, in the final thought, as I mentioned earlier, training needs to be viewed as an important component of an animal care program. And so the beginning of any evaluation is beginning with the assessing the need for training as a solution at all. I wish you all good luck with your training programs and please do let the moderator know if you have any questions um, for me or about the presentation. Have a great day. Well, I would like to thank Dr. Dyson again for that outstanding presentation. I want to remind our audience you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And again, all questions are going to be answered via email. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Lottie, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when that webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. 
And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>